good to finally meet you. I'm glad we could make this work. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Scott. Good to uh, meet you via Skype too. I think I first came across you probably via Twitter, um, but pretty quickly came across your Battles of the Ancients website, um, which is which I found to be just a tremendous resource for military historians. So thanks for all the great work on that. Oh, thank you for the kind words. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So, But I know the thing we, we both really share an interest in and the thing we wanted to talk about today was our common fascination with Hellenistic Bactria. 100%. 100%. <laughs> So I wanted to start off, and I guess, frame things a little bit with a, a quote from uh, historian Frank Holt, uh, his wonderful book, Lost World of the Golden King. So I'm quoting here, Along the banks of the Amu Darya and the foothills of the Hindu Kush, Bactria once thrived as an independent kingdom ruled by the descendants of Western colonists. These wayward Greeks, remnants of Alexander the Great's army, waged incessant wars with their neighbors and with each other, growing richer all the while. They minted the largest gold and silver coins in the world, governed, it was said, a thousand cities, conquered deep into India, which Alexander had failed to do, and then vanished. Their history morphed into legend, until even that was lost except for the names of a few phantom kings lingering in the quiet corners of classical and Renaissance literature. So I think that quote is pretty effective at capturing, you know, some, my fascination and what drew me to the, uh, to the Greco-Bactrians. If you can recall, what, how did you first become interested? Well, quite a similar kind of thing, right? It, and I think your quote really emphasized it. It's the fact that it's this, this this Greek kingdom on like on the a far edge of the known world. It's exotic, as it were, and um, you you it's shrouded in myth. But at the same time, you have these you know snippets of actual like factual information with which you can combine with like archaeological evidence to to create this uh, an interesting narrative of like the kingdom, and like like so one of the most fascinating facts in that your quote um, kind of mentioned it just then was like a the largest coinage in antiquity you know was actually made in the greco-bactrian kingdom that remarkable gold coin of eucratides you know I, I can't remember the exact measurements but just things like that is just so remarkable um so maybe let's get a little bit into the history so the oldest uh culture that we know of in the region you know we're going back to the bronze age so there's a culture called the oxus culture or the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex, which is centered on the Oxus River. It goes back as far, I think latest estimates are about 2400 BC, quite a ways back in time. And there's some interesting finds related to that culture, which, you know, were pretty exquisite. I remember seeing an axe head one time in, in the Met in New York that was just amazing from the region. Um, but then moving into recorded history, um, I guess the regions, you know, first recorded and documented when Cyrus the Great uh, moved into it, you know, in the mid sixth century BC, and then, you know, following Cyrus's conquests, you know, the region was essentially under Persian control for the next couple centuries, and then you get the arrival of a certain bright young lad named Alexander the Great, <laughs> and uh, so maybe you can help us take up the story from there a little bit. Yes, well, well. As you, as you say, it was good, like, with the background and stuff like that, you know, the Persian Empire, Bactria has become, over the 200 years of Achaemenid rule, and it's become one of the most important regions in the whole of the Persian Empire. And one of the key reasons for this is a military reason. You mentioned the Oxus culture, you know, because all the cities, like the main flourishing cities of Bactria, were, were spaced all along like the banks of the Oxus or its tributaries, you know, the most famous being the city of Bactra itself. Um, and so they're really good fertile lands from where they were able to rear these really powerful horses. And these horses, uh, Bactria, the natives of Bactria soon became renowned as like these famous formidable cavalrymen. And, you know, from the plains of Plataea in Greece, all the way, of course, to the plain of Galgamela in 331 BC uh, with Alexander the Great, between that time and in those battles especially, the Bactrian cavalry are viewed as like the Persian elite horsemen. Right. Uh, and it, 
and it's a reputation uh, well deserved as we'll, we'll we'll see but going back i'm not going to do the too much on that as you said um so alexander the great he's defeated the persian king darius the third you know in the two critical battles the battle of issus and the battle of gargamela he's conquered the four main administrative capitals of the Achaemenid empire ecbatana babylon susa and famously he's destroyed the royal capital at persepolis the royal Achaemenid capital and in i think it's a uh, mid 330 bc darius is killed whilst he's attempting to flee eastwards he is intending to reach bactria where he can raise a new army to to still oppose alexander but he is killed by one of his subordinates a man called bessus and once again there's another link to bactria here because bessus was formerly the satrap or governor of bactria now following this Bessus, with a small entourage, he retreats. He basically follows what Darius was going to do. He retreats to Bactria, where he hopes to conjure up a new army with which to oppose Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander the Great, he goes in in pursuit, and he kind of takes a kind of like a a path logistical for logistical reasons. He basically does like a horseshoe path, as it were. He he misses out Margiana uh, and doesn't cross the, the the huge desert there. He goes. Uh, southwards towards Kandahar and Herat where he founds a, a couple of cities then he goes through the Hindu Kush and eventually he arrives in the region of Bactria in the spring of 329 BC now in that time Bessus has uh, he's been he's been in Bactria and he's hoping to gain this to amass this large army with which to oppose Alexander's arrival and to be honest, he probably he had good reason for thinking this. In the past, the Bactrians had very much been open to supporting challenges to like uh, the Achaemenid throne. They'd done it with Darius the First, for instance. But when Alexander gets there, rather than being confronted by like a hostile Bactria, city after city uh, welcome him with open arms, and he faces basically no um, no opposition whatsoever. Bessus is forced to flee. He has to flee north of the Oxus River into the neighbouring region of Sogdia, where he similarly is unable to find any support, and he's eventually handed over by his former uh, allies uh, and has a gruesome execution at Alexander's hand. At least to Alexander's mind, the resistance of Bessus, you know, has been eliminated, so therefore he probably has a feeling that, you know, with, with that end, you know, the region's going to be coming under his control. But then what happens kind of after that? Well, 100%, 100%. You know, he hasn't had much um, resistance whatsoever. In fact, when he actually goes into Sogdia in pursuit of Bessus, just before he captures him, he leaves basically a token garrison, like a really small garrison in Bactria. That's how confident he is in believing that Bactria has been completely subdued. And he goes north into Sogdia. He gets, he gets control of Bessus. And similarly, in Sogdia, he thinks that the Sogdians kind of welcome him. Uh, well, they don't, well, like um, they don't oppose him, as it were, at least for the start. What Alexander does is he he heads north north to the northern, I guess, uh, quite a permeable, it's quite a fluid border, but like uh, a physical border, as it were, like in the Yaxartes River, the uh, Syridaria River today. Right. And there you mentioned cyrus the great's conquest earlier that was where cyrus had drawn basically the limit of his accommodated empire that was where he fa- he famously founded his uh, city of cyropolis and alexander does a similar thing he founds alexandria escate or or alexandria the furthest and i, I think you went there didn't you scott or- it's yeah it, uh, recently i was lucky enough to um to travel through a portion of uzbekistan and when i was in tashkent uh in uzbekistan i was within tens of miles of the location of uh, of alexander the farthest so i was very very excited about that i nice. uh, didn't get a chance to actually visit the ruins but uh, it would have been fantastic but yeah <laughs> I, I, very lucky well, i think they're still debating exactly where it is but if you could find the ruins that'd be fantastic <laughs> sure uh, sure uh, <laughs> But basically, Alexander, he founds um, Alexandria Escate, and he's very much um, what's a key uh, modern source, which I, I, I'm looking at for this, is, is Frank Holt, who we mentioned earlier. And um, basically, the ancient sources say the, the reason why 
soon the Sogdian nobles and like the region of Sogdia becomes hostile to him is because Alexander he invites all the Sogdian nobles and some of the Bactrian nobles to a, to a meeting at Bactra and they fear that that is where they're going to get arrested and they're going to be uh, they're going to basically lose their status however it's actually more likely that it was Alexander's founding of Alexandria Skate which caused this change in opinion in Sogdia. And the reason for this is as follows. Now, when Alexander found, found Alexandria the furthest, he is thinking very much in the European frame of mind. He's seen the, the north of Macedonia and his father, King Philip II's creation of a frontier in Thrace with his uh, creation of cities such as Philippopolis and Kabyle. And... Alexander has this idea of creating this physical border, you know, to 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 emphasize, you know, the borders of his empire. And that's what he does with founding Alexandria Escate. He wants to mark the Yaxartes River as his frontier. Now, I say in European terms, it's nothing new. But for the Sogdians, this was something completely uh, against what they believed as well, or what they were used to, because north of the Yaxartes River, you have the nomadic tribes, the eastern Scythians, or the eastern Scythians, or the Sakai. Although they were, they had, they shared a lot of um, culture with the Sogdians further south, and they were very much intermingled with each other quite a lot. So the Yaxartes River wasn't really seen as a border between the two regions it was like seen as, as very fluid it's very permeable but alexander by creating alexandria the furthest this military colony with a prime purpose of you know erecting this physical border to basically block out the nomads to the north this angers the sogdians for that very reason and because of that they do not want this city there now they see that as alexander you know basically putting his imprint on their society they don't like that so oh very quickly the sogdian nobles that were formerly allied to alexander across the region they rebel against him they managed to levy a, a well small bands of sogdian guerrilla fighters and over the next two years, Alexander faces this really hard, um, hard pressed revolt, mainly from the Sogdians. It must be noted that actually very few Bactrians actually take part in the revolt. It is mainly a Sogdian revolt. Mm. 